Uh, you might be a redneck if you've heard that. Uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Blue collar comedy tour situations when it comes to what? Thank you. Uh, new show, American Bible Challenge on the Game Show Network. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Jeff Foxworthy. Ooh, this thank, is you, really thank, you, thank you for the rousing round of applause. I don't blame you, sir. So, Jeff, very nice to be here. Yeah, how, how are you, by the way? Good to see you. Uh, life is still busy, which at this point, I kind of thought I would be done. So I'm, I'm very excited to still be busy and still be doing stuff I love to do. Now, obviously, I think the question burning in everyone's mind, uh, what's a grit chip? <laughs> Because the Jeff Foxworthy's Grip Chip 200, as you know, is this evening. You are the Grand Marshal, so I think I think that's what we should start with. What is a Grip Chip? We should probably. Um, Mark Burnett, who produced Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader, uh, also produces Survivor and uh, The Apprentice, but but he does a show called Shark Tank. And uh, a year or so ago, Mark asked me if I would be on Shark Tank, which sounded like a good idea. Like, if you haven't seen the show, it's where entrepreneurs bring uh, their ideas in front of a bunch of investors. And I thought, yeah, that's cool. And so I did it. Here's the, if you ever get a chance to be one of the sharks on Shark Tank, run the other way. Because what I didn't know was everybody on the planet that's had an idea, not a good idea, just an idea, contacts you after you're on Shark Tank. And so I was literally inundated with thousands of letters and packages from people having. And so. About a year ago, I did a sleep study because I snore so bad, and the guy that came to do the, the sleep study on me, Sean McDonald, uh, said to me, because I, I always want to know people's stories, he said, well, most of the time I have a restaurant at the Roswell Tap, and we make this thing called a grid chip, and I brought you some to try, and I'm rolling my eyes going, here we go with the Shark Tank thing all over again. And so I, I ate a couple of them. And then in the course of talking to him, I ate the entire bag of them. And I'm like, dang gum, these things are good. And, and he's like, well, you should do something with us. So over the last year, uh, we started working on other flavors. And uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things, everybody that tries it comes back and wants more of them. And so, you know, I'm real weird. I don't want to put my name on something that you'd be ashamed to have your sure, name on. But sure. I get free grit chips now. Uh, As we so, remember, the Jeff Foxworthy's butt paste did not. Butt paste. That was it, a commercial failure. Yeah. The first year, it was good. It was, it was a great product. It was a great product. And uh, the rashes went right away. They did. They so. did. The proof was in the pudding. So, And I've tried those grit chips. They're excellent. And I love them. They're excellent. I love they, them. They Marcy gave me some. I believe that you all could get some grit chips if you ask very you nicely. Could. And then you'll go write very nice things about them. And oh, we do. We got grit got chips right yeah, there. And, and, and thumbs up, thumbs down. Got a big thumbs up right there. So. Free, free food is, is not turned down here in the media center very often. So I think you're set there. Hey, have you ever been to, to Atlanta Motor Speedway before? I had the first race I ever went to in my life was at, it was at Atlanta Motor Speedway. I haven't grown up in Georgia, but my dad was a. a I looked over there and saw the Petty car. My dad was a huge Richard Petty fan, so uh, yeah, the first race I ever went to. And, and I was telling somebody, because they had the little die-cast cars, I took the program from that race and went home and took all my little matchbox and Hot Wheels and I got model paint and I painted the cars up like NASCAR oh. cars, yeah. So that was 30 years ahead of my time on that. Isn't that yeah. cool? Does that mean you have any favorites for this weekend? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was trying to explain to these guys, I said, NASCAR's like country music. Jeff Gordon and I were just talking about this an hour ago. I said, once, pe once people become a fan of yours, they're, in. they're yours for life. Country music kind of the same way. And so, it, and, and I think that's why, you know, you, you probably don't see any other form of sports or, or any other form of entertainment other than country music where, like, NASCAR and country music is so interactive with the fans. But... I, and I think that's why people stay with somebody their whole life. But I was always a three-car guy, and so I'm, I'm a Dale Jr. guy. Uh, good, good year to be a Dale Jr. It's a good year to be a Dale Jr. guy. Yeah. When you were talking to Jeff Gordon, did it come up that uh, 20 years ago was his first cup race here, at which time he had a mustache? Obviously, you but, are but, showing your love for him by keeping it all these years. Um, is that a correct correlation? Your mustache equals that you love Jeff Gordon? No, because Jeff Gordon's mustache, and we, and we can go pull the pictures up, was not in the league with mine and Dale's mustache. You're right. 
But yeah. he did have a mullet. He did have a little bit of a mullet. So I don't know it if was that's more, a plus but It was kind of more of a caterpillar mustache. It wasn't, it wasn't the big Dale Sr. mustache. It was like a junior in high school mustache. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Like really proud of your facial hair. Right. Let's let it ride. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I don't even know. I've had this since the 11th grade. I don't know if I have a lip anymore. This could just be runaway nose hairs at this point. I... That's fantastic. Uh, you guys, I, I can have fun with Jeff all day, but I feel like it is uh, your job to ask questions, so let's get started with that. Boy, look at all the hands. Where do we start? I know, right back there. Ed Hinton, ESPN.com. Jeff, given that probably one of your staples by definition of a redneck was if the word NASCAR was anywhere in your wedding vows, uh, and considering how much NASCAR people like to go after deals, how come it's taken you so long to reach a formal deal to do something with NASCAR, and can you remember some of the highlights or lowlights of some ridiculous plans you might have been offered since, since NASCAR became such a part of your routine? You know, NASCAR is, is when I started writing redneck jokes, um, Anytime I would hit a slow spot, you just kind of have to go to the infield and spend a day, and then I was able to write another book. Because um, <laughs> I, I, I did the, wrote the first book in 87. I did the first page a day calendar in 1990. Larry the Cable Guy asked me the other day, he goes, how long have you been doing those calendars? I said, 22 years. And every year I'm thinking, there can't be 365 more of these. And then you walk through the infield and you go, yeah, there can. There's, there's 365 more. Um, I've always been a fan, you know, it, it, the, some of the earliest redneck jokes were, were centered on NASCAR. Uh, if you think the most effective form of advertising is on the hood of a car at 200 miles an hour, uh, if you've ever put a race car on a prayer list, uh, uh, if, if, if you think the last four words of the Star Spangled Banner are gentlemen, start your engines. Uh, so yeah, NASCAR's always, I've always been a fan. and. Uh, I don't know why it took so long to do a deal. I mean, it's because I feel like we have a lot of the same audience, you know. It's uh, people that are NASCAR fans probably are blue collar fans. So, it, but it's, but it's kind of cool. I mean, as a kid that grew up in Hapel, Georgia, to, to, have a, to have a race here with your name on it, I have to think I can scratch one off the bucket list. It's a big deal Thanks, for sure. Uh, when. I, how how funny is it to you? Like I, I know that you're just a you're just a, a, a lucky man, a blessed guy. So like when you go to the mall, uh, is it still funny to you in in how like people's perception of you is so many different things, but it's it can always come back. To so redneck. what so what do you think they're perceiving? Yeah, you know, well it's I just assumed I was going to be the redneck guy my entire life. Sure. I mean everywhere I go, hey Jim, my be redneck. Hey, what's up? And then. But then when I started hosting Smarter than a Fifth Grader, all of a sudden I'd be in the grocery store and have like a 50-year-old guy walk by and go, only missed two questions last night. You know? <laughs> and now I get, I get almost as much as the redneck thing, people yelling, hey, I'm not Smarter than a Fifth Grader. And I'm like, I'm not either. If they didn't give me the answers, it'd be the shortest show in the history of television. <laughs> We, this is a true story. Well, fifth grader, we had a, it was like a second grade grammar question, and it was something about an antonym. And the lady said, "Oh, I remember." She said there were homonyms and synonyms and antonyms. She said, "But I swear I can't remember the difference in them." Can you use it in a sentence? And I'm like, "My antonym came over for Thanksgiving dinner. I, I have no idea what it is. I don't pretend to be Alex Trebek." Huh. Doug. Doug Rice, PRN. Jeff, you talk about the constant stream of people coming up to you with new redneck joke lines. Do you ever use those? Can you use those? What's your policy? Yeah, you, well, you know, it, I found real early on when I was writing them that, that when I tried to make them up, they never worked as well as, as true stories. And so, yeah, I mean, it's... It's, nobody ever comes up to me and says, excuse me, Mr. Foxworthy, people are like, hey, Jim, let me tell you what my brother did. And so usually I've got a stack of <laughs> note cards in my back pockets. Because, I mean, the story of the, the, of the guy getting his nipple bitten off by a beaver, I mean, you can't make something like that up. If you made it up, people would, people would, I mean, people would say, yeah, you, you know, never happened. But it, somehow with my crowd, it does happen all the time. So, yeah, I do... Uh, I do use them all the time. Bob Hawker, Sporting News. Um, if you don't have a NASCAR infield to go to to find more material, what's then the sec what's then your alternative? 
Well, my wife's from Louisiana, so uh, that, that's always a real good fault. You've seen Swamp People, that's her family reunion. So, uh, Walmart's always a good one. I, I, I love a Walmart. And, and I, I've always said in my comedy, because in my comedy I've always just assumed if I thought it or my wife said it or my kids or relatives did it, surely we weren't the only ones. And, and I've always encouraged people... You should go to the fair every chance, every year. You should go to the fair because after five minutes, you're going to feel better about your own family. You see people at the fair. People in Africa send money to help. So, yeah, there's never a shortage of rednecks out there. That's really true. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wonder. I mean, you kind of, you kind of, Jeff, have this the personality that is like I am one. You know, as you're making fun of of this, uh, this characteristic. I mean, do you ever, have you ever touched a nerve that somebody reacted in a way that surprised you? You know, probably, that's probably the number one question I get out of New York and LA media is they will say, how many people are offended by this? And, and, and it's, it's actually, I don't know that anybody's ever been mad about it. It's, but, but, but I think it, it all started because I talk like this, I always wore jeans and boots, I always drove a truck. So when, when I would start doing comedy in New York and Chicago in the early days, that's all I would get is Foxworthy, you're nothing but an old redneck from Georgia. And then one night I'm playing in a club right outside Detroit. They're kidding me about being a redneck. Well, the club we were playing in was attached to a bowling alley that had valet parking. And I said, if y'all don't think you have rednecks in Michigan, look out the window. People are valet parking at the bowling alley. And so, I know I'm one, but obviously a lot of people don't know. And uh, never thinking it was going to be books or calendar. I'm just trying to write material. But it just struck a nerve. It, it, and what I kind of realized from doing comedy, I've been to all 50 states. When you get 10 minutes, 15 minutes outside of any city, people are the same. I mean, you guys cover this sport all over the country. Everywhere you go, it's, they're the same. And, and it never would have worked that well and or worked that long if it had been an isolated southern thing. But it's, you know, and, and somebody said early on, they said, well, you're kind of talking about the lowest common denominator. I said, no, I'm not. I'm talking about the most common denominator. They're, they're kind of the backbone of this country, you know. They're the people that get up and go to work and get up and go to church and get up and go to war when they need to. And so, but it also worked because I wasn't, laughing at somebody. I was laughing with somebody. I mean, there, there, people always say, where you come up with it? I'm like, there's no research going on. This is my family and friends, you know? <laughs> and I think that's why I could do it, is people realize that, yeah, hey, I wasn't laughing at you. Yep, I am too. Money. I don't know what the major of that editorial introduction of me. <laughs> it's because I love you. It's because I love Money you. Money Dutton Gaskin is dead. And uh, Jeff, I promise you that if you cover NASCAR for a number of years, you will conclude that there are red dates in every corner of this country of ours. But what I wanted to ask you is, is that when I was young, I was a great admirer of the songwriter Tom T. Hall. And at some point, I, I, I said, you know, how come Tom T. doesn't write those songs that I love? And I realized that is when you reach a certain level of celebrity, you can't just stand over next to the Coca-Cola box and, and, and observe people because people were asking you for your autographs. And I just wondered how that effect has been on you. What has the effect been on your ability to connect with people when you couldn't just deal with them sort of anonymously and as a uh, you know, fly on the wall, so to speak? That's a, you know what? I don't think I've ever been asked that question. That's a great question. It's... Uh, you know, I work real hard to uh, to have as normal a life as I can have for what I do. I, and, and my kids are old enough now that they drive, but I, but up until then, I took my kids to school every single day. I go to the grocery store, I go to the Home Depot. I, I want, still want to have a normal life. And, and, and it's nice, because like where I live, they get, you know, first time you go in the grocery store, you sign 30 autographs, the second time 20, and then you're down to 10, and then it's just, hey, yeah. And, and so, because that's what comics do, you, you observe life, and I always thought that's why comics normally didn't have very long careers, was because, remember like Eddie Murphy, the first, movie, the first uh, album he ever did was so funny, and then like he did his second special, and he's talking about getting to an argument with his limo driver. Nobody can identify with that, you know, and, and, and so that's why I always wanted 
to have a normal life. And sometimes I miss it. You know, people are always nice to me. I mean, whatever small level of celebrity I have, it's it's people, hey, Jeff, and, you know, and it's always friendly. But uh, I say to my wife sometimes now, it, it must be like how people that are handicapped feel. Because, you know, when you walk into a room, people stare at you. You know, and... and Knowing what you know about yourself, I'm not worth staring at. I'm, t I'm two decisions from drywall. I I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. That's, that's a quote of the day right there. Postman. Oh, in the back, Marcy's. I'm going to go with Marcy. Oh, no, I'm saying I'm going with Marcy. So, hey, Marty, what's up? Hello, uh, it's my friend Marty. It's great. Hello, Jeff. Hey there. Uh, Marty Smith, ESPN. I'm doing this story today about how the 1979 Daytona 500 kind of thrust NASCAR into the mainstream because two old hillbillies got in fight, right? So, from your perspective, I wonder uh, what what your opinion is on why NASCAR fans like to see these guys have such raw emotion and fight. I, I had a comic buddy, Vic Henley, that used to say that people, they, they, they wanted to see a wreck, you know, because they're like, because they would think, well, you know, my life's hard as hell. I work two jobs, but he's on fire, so I'm doing better than he is. Uh, I, you know what? I think it's, I think it's that thing that, that makes us human. You know, you, I, I kind of miss those days in NASCAR. You know, I mean, I, then I'm sure that's politically incorrect, but I loved when Dale would get mad with somebody and just put them into the wall. Uh, and I don't know, I'm sure that's politically wrong, and I'm sure I'll get called into the trailer for it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you're not allowed to do that in other, except hockey, you still get in a fight. I think that's why, I mean, let's be honest, why else would you watch a hockey game with, without hoping that somebody gets into a fight? So, uh, and, and you know, that, that moment, because I think, if I'm not wrong, wasn't that the first televised NASCAR race? Like, And, and I remember watching that and, and just thinking, how do you ever top this? How do you ever top the last lap? Brothers getting out and, and just getting in a fight with somebody on the last lap. That's one of the greatest sporting moments in history to this day. Great question, you guys. Great question. Jeff, um, how, talk a little bit, you talked about you know the excitement of having your name on a race here at Atlanta Motor Speedway, but how did this progress? Your thoughts when the idea came to you guys or was brought to you and presented to you? How did the, how did the whole process happen? With, with it being on a race, I, I, I think it happened really fast. Uh, the the American Bible Challenge, I, I've been doing press for it because we had our debut a week ago yesterday. So I've been in, you know doing all the New York and L.A. and all that press for, for the last couple of weeks. And actually got asked, I think, the end of last week, hey, we got a chance to be the title sponsor on the truck race. Do you want to do that? And I'm like, okay, can I finish up? Yeah, are you kidding me? We're going to be, you know, the sponsor of a truck race? Heck yeah. And so then I kind of had to move up all my uh, press for, for Bible Challenge so I could be down here today. But I, I mean, seriously, it's, it's is like a redneck dream come true to sit your face on a race car. How stupid is that? <laughs> You should travel with us every weekend. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Jeff Al Pierce from Auto Week in Detroit, by the way. Yay. Did, did anybody ever tell you in your career early on, this stick is not going to work, find something better to do? And the other thing might be, if you ever run low on material, any media center will give you another year. <laughs> so just come in any time. But did anybody ever try to talk to you out of what you thought was a good deal? You know, the first... Uh, the first time I got out of the South and I started, I won a contest in Atlanta called the Great Southeastern Laugh Off, and the prize for that was to perform at Catch a Rising Star in New York. And I went up there, you know, I've never been to New York City. And the only advice I got, and I had several people come up and go, Look, I don't want to hurt your feelings, right? But you've got to take voice lessons and lose that stupid accent you got. And, and I kept thinking, Well, where I come from, you're the one with a stupid accent. But, I had a lot of people early on tell me I needed to lose my accent, and my thought always was, well, you know what, at least a quarter of the country talks like I do. Why do I have to lose, Seinfeld's not losing his accent, why do I have to lose mine? Um, and then when I started doing the redneck things, it was funny, Richard Belzer, uh, who, I don't know, used to do comedy and then 
you know, NYPD police and all that stuff. He pulled me outside of Catch a Rising Star and, and he said, look, not for nothing. You got to stop these redneck jokes. It's never going anywhere. It's and, and and to this day, whenever I run into Richard somewhere, he goes, "This is good advice I gave you about the redneck stuff, right? It never went anywhere." But you know, you just got to stay true to yourself. I mean, I always, I, I think the guys that talk about what they know, that's what works the best for them, and it's what, I mean, it's who I am. I'm, I'm a guy from Hateful, Georgia. I, we had a dirt yard. Never in my wildest dreams did I think this. I never thought it would work as a comedian. I, I carried a tool bag for IBM. I, they entered, I got a bunch of guys I work with, entered me in a comedy contest. And I won the contest. I had no idea what I was doing. And I quit my job. And I, and I remember my mother looking at me one night and going, what is wrong with you? Are you on drugs? We can get you help. And I'm like, no, I'm not on drugs. I, I just... Man, this I want to try this, and and I really thought if I could get away with it for a couple of years, I'd come back with my hat in my hand. And five years later, I was on Johnny Carson, and uh, that same mother is saying, "You know, you wasted all those years at IBM." Uh, <laughs> but but for the, you know, and the young people don't understand that, but the older ones, for a comedian to get called over to the chair on Johnny Carson, that was Mount Everest for a comedian. And, you know, Johnny was kind of like Caesar. He decided if you lived or died. And so it, I still have that picture on my desk, a black and white picture of me sitting in the chair talking to Johnny Carson, and Johnny's laughing. And I'm like, that's all I ever wanted to do right there. I mean, that's that's it. So I'm sure I forgot the question, so I'm sure I didn't answer it. But, but if you've ever asked a question in the media center without your shoes on, you might be a redneck. I'd like to see your bare feet there. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Foxworthy.